to our guests and everyone online, hello to you. And uh, just have some more, okay? Oh, oh. How's, how, how's the day of Pentecost going? What a marvelous time, marvelous opportunity. Think about what God has been doing with us, working with us daily as he does. What a glorious opportunity it is to even be called of God in the first place. To be called of him, to have his Holy Spirit. Think about when you were baptized. Think about the time when you committed your life to God. How there was a time of surrender, a time of repentance. And God saw us through. He, he presented to us a wonderful future that he has prepared for us. And we we decided, yes, I want that. I remember saying it myself. Yes, I want what you have for the future. What do I have to do to attain that? Let me surrender to you and ask for your Holy Spirit. Well, today we want to look at the Holy Spirit a bit and understand a little bit through the life of our one of the disciples of Jesus, of Peter. But first of all, I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 1 and verse 8, if you would, please. Mark chapter 1 and verse 8, a very basic verse. It says, I indeed baptized you with water. And this is John the Baptist speaking, saying, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Very interesting verse because it looks as though that there are two parts to it. The one part has to do with being baptized with the water. The other part is he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So what's happening here? The second part is looks like it has to do with Jesus' involvement. He, it says, with a capital H, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And we know that as we're called and living with this way of life that we've committed ourselves to, we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. In a process of growing the whole time. So we want to look at the life of Peter, for example, life that was changed, the life that changed as he went along through his time of being a disciple. One of the things he learned, as we all learn, is what are the things that are important, what are the things that are not so important? And the things we used to think were so important, the things we committed our time to, we we're, oh, we, we just wanted to do those things, involve ourselves, think of those things. Then we decided, no, they're not so important after all. <laughs> What's really important are the things like we are today. Here we are on the day of Pentecost. We're here. We're keeping this, this holy day. Now this has become important to us as opposed to what was in the old days for us. But previously, Peter was a rough fisherman. He was one of many who fished in the Sea of Galilee. You can read of different examples of the fish. There's a, I have a magazine where they're talking about the, the kind of nets that they used, the, the work it took to drag the fish to shore. These are men who have a rough life, a rough existence. They're always trying to uh, make a living for themselves. But Jesus had Peter be called, and then Peter became a, a, a servant. Peter became someone who now wanted to commit his life to Jesus Christ. Now, you know, he had his problems, of course, and he had his times when he wanted to pull back. But remember how Chuck Smith told us some time ago, he mentioned about how we want to have new people coming along. And we're hoping that through the telecast, through our webcast, through other means, we'll have new people coming in that door. And when they come in, what will they have? What will, we, what will they encounter when they see us? What will we encounter when we see them? And one of the things we want to do is embrace them, to look forward to them, and to see kind of their growth as they come along. When someone's newly converted, it's amazing to see how they move, how they progress in their life. And they started out in that place and they grow and they, we can observe that and see that along and that's exciting. And to, to kind of help them through it. Well, 
It looks as though Peter had that same kind of experience as what I'm trying to illustrate today. And in, if you go to Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, and this follows a long story here. You could read the whole story on your own sometime if you haven't read it in a while, is to go back through Acts 10 and 11 and review the story of Cornelius. When Cornelius had a conversion, of course, the first Gentile who was converted to Christianity, to the way of Christ. So that was a huge thing for the whole Gentile world to be introduced, for God to introduce his Holy Spirit to them. But Peter here has a recognition of that. So that's what he, what he notes. And in verse 16 of chapter 11, we're quoting Peter here, and then he quotes Jesus. He says, then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, now he's quoting Jesus, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then in verse 17, if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? But can you imagine what it's like for Peter to have experienced the change that was being taken place in Cornelius? Okay? This is what I'm illustrating by us seeing a change in other people when they come. New people coming along and you see this change in them. We get to experience this as Peter, hopefully, <laughs> maybe not exactly the same way, but we can, he noticed that the Holy Spirit was coming out. Holy Spirit reigned and it was poured out. Uh, in Adam Clark's commentary, he makes an interesting, insightful note here. Adam Clark said about Peter. He said, therefore, when he saw that the Holy Spirit fell on these Gentiles, he considered it a fulfillment of our Lord's promise. Peter was aware of the Lord's promise from that you would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he's watching this happen through the example of Cornelius. So two men are being affected by what the events taking place. Cornelius on the one hand and Peter on the other hand. They're both growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ in their own way. Peter saw a marvelous thing, a very moving and apparently life-changing thing for him. It was interesting that God worked with these two men. So what is he talking about, about the Holy Spirit being poured out? We'll go back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And verse 4. Acts chapter 2. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's a reference in this chapter to Joel, the second chapter, 20, verse 28, which we can, you can look up, to show that God would pour out His Holy Spirit upon His people, pouring it out. And it's like this waterfall coming down. Do you, do we, do I grasp the idea that the Holy Spirit was given to us? Do we ever note that? Do we, do we understand that God is wanting to pour it out on us? When we were baptized and given His Holy Spirit, there's a dimension and, a, and an awesome, amazing element of God. Jesus said He would Give this Holy Spirit. You'll be baptized with it. That means you're going to be soaking wet. You're going to be immersed in it. Right? And that is available to us. But like with us, like with me, I'm sure I don't, if I can speak for you, but I tend to stifle the Spirit. What He gave me in all those years ago, is available to me if I if I would use it properly if I would engage it put it into action but I don't <laughs> this is the sad part of it 
And that's this coming to this day, the Pentecost day, you're reminded of the reality of the fact that he gave us this Holy Spirit and we have to put it into action as much as we can. And what about us, brethren? Think about this. This is something, again, to pray, to help ask God, Father, please. And one of the things I find with myself, if you don't, you may have this, you may not have this problem. <laughs> but I get, I get tripped up by the adversary plenty of times. He puts thoughts in my mind, uh, distractions in my mind, things that come in, envies, jealousies, all kinds of garbage comes running in my mind. And when those things come in, guess what? The train of the Holy Spirit on its track goes off the track, kind of. It's over here on the siding. The Holy Spirit's kind of over here. Do you remember to go and get that Holy Spirit and bring it back in? And so you go to the Father, Father, forgive me and lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the wicked one. And replace that wicked one's influence with your righteous spirit got to replace it put the Holy Spirit in so that it can go out and I'm going to give another message about that next Sabbath but this high calling is tremendous awesome and let's let's do what we can do what we can and, and Peter had that example in him watch Cornelius changing that must have been so miraculous for him and note and remember Jesus said that's what would happen I'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit okay there's a real action going on so this will lead into and this this will lead into another part of this idea and that is to um, what do we give we give to the world we give to the people we make a contribution of the high calling that God has given us and how do we make a contribution? We also make our verbal uh, contributions, what we'll talk about next week, but we make a financial contribution too. So I'm going into our offertory message at the moment. And going to give this message out is, is, takes financial support, of course. So we go to Deuteronomy chapter 16, where we read in, in here of God's expression of what he wants us to do. And, he tells us when to do it. And Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9 says, You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. And then in verse 16, it says, Three times in the year all your males, or heads of household as we know, shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. God has chosen this place. So remind of <laughs> on the day when this place was chosen, we looked for other places. And we had chosen, we had thought of many places around town that we thought we would select. None of those were what he wanted. This is the place he wanted. He chose us. And Mr. Veller accidentally turned in the... In the <laughs> nope, this is where he wanted us. So, and the place he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Oh, we don't want that. We want to give the God at least something of what he has given to us. Tremendous. Anyway, so we'll have offertory music playing. It's a verse of Praise the Eternal with a Psalm from page 42 in the hymnal. And the, uh, uh, the offertory will start when the music begins.